So thank you for your story. Uh, indeed, a very uh, interesting topic, making mm. learning work. Yeah. And the, the numbers you gave uh, were actually yeah, quite shocking, I think, for mm. many of us in the audience, how yeah. that the, actually the skill, your skill actually drops after you do a training. So what can a manager or a company do to, uh, uh, to prevent that and to get most of the, most of the value out of the training? Yeah. Well, it's, most, it's actually about very small things. So it's about building training, integrating it into this whole idea of feedback and coaching and actually managers noticing when people go on training. So if I'm your manager and you're about to go on a training course, you know, best practice would say before you go, maybe we'd have a 10 minute conversation about you're on that course next week, what do you want to get out of it? And then you might tell me what you wanted to get out of it and then we might say, great, well why don't we catch up after you've been on the course, tell me what you thought was useful, anything that you want to try that's new and so on and so on. And then you start that coaching conversation. And I think the main point I want to make is it doesn't need to be difficult. You know, people sometimes think, oh, but I'm not a coach or I'm not this, or I'm not that. It's really actually about, you know, paying attention to the people who work for you and, and trying to develop them. But if you can integrate formally training and, uh, sorry, feedback and coaching, I think that works best. And, you know, certainly if organisations are doing big change programmes, it's something that I see a lot and it's something that we always advise that people do. Uh, I, I also agree with you with what you said uh, just now on the stage that uh, for many organizations it's very difficult you know to internalize yeah. uh, those feedback and coaching yeah. uh, processes so yeah. what what do you have any uh, uh, examples for organizations who actually have done it in a, in a good way uh, and what what could yeah. other organizations learn from them yeah I, I think one of the things so I think there's a number of things there so when I was a sales manager for example um, what we did you know I worked as a sales manager for quite a while what we tended to do was to promote the people who were the best salespeople. But actually being a salesperson and being a sales manager is fundamentally different. So when you're a sales manager, your job is to get performance out of people, which is all about feedback and coaching. So I think one thing organizations can do is to understand that being a manager, when you manage people, requires a skill set around people. So you don't just get promoted because you're super clever or you're super good at your job. Your job is about getting performance out of your people. So that's one thing about recruitment. Second thing is, if you recruit people who haven't had experience of managing a team, give them some training and coaching themselves so that they understand you know, how to give feedback, how to have a, con a coaching conversation, and encourage them to do it. So I think it's about p taking people management seriously, whereas we tend to think, well, if you're a nice guy, hey, guess what, you can just do it. You know, and actually, we can make that process more thought through. Uh, another uh, problem you mentioned in mm. your in your story, which which I agree with, is that mm. a lot of companies uh, uh, tend to think uh, for their clients. So, yeah. You know this. Uh, we know what they want paradigm. Yeah. So, yeah. what uh, what would be your advice? How can they get out of this paradigm and out yeah. of their comfort zone? Yeah, I think to see that to, to really have this process of seeing the their process as their customers see it. And although I chose to share an example about a train company. You know, the one with Great Ormond Street was not, because people sometimes think, well, it's easy if it's a journey, because you can talk about customer journey. But we've done similar things with insurance companies, where we've said, what's the first point of contact with your organization? It's a website. Then you might call a call center to get some information. Then you might talk to an advisor. Then you might, you know, get a proposal. Then you might sign a contract. That's a customer journey. Experience it as your customers do. So take off your insurance worker, you know, hat and put on your go onto the website, is the language easy, has it got a lot of jargon, and so on and so on. So it is about seeing things as a customer, and you know, if you can pretend to be a customer, it makes it much easier. Um, and I think, you know, the danger is when we start saying we know, we know what our customers want.